Okay, welcome all to the Environmental Health 480, what, 584? 580 seminar, sorry. I'm Marty Cohen, I'm faculty in the Department of Environmental Occupational Health and Sci Health Sciences, and I have the pleasure to introduce our Bryce Lecture and Bryce Lecturer for this year. And um, <clears throat> it's named after Peter A. Bryce. Uh, but first I'm, I'm gonna talk a little about the lectureship, but Peter Bryce Memorial Lectureship was established by the Bryce family who's represented here, here, there, people with a lot of UW swag are the Bryce family. Um, in honor of Peter Bryce, an associate professor emeritus in the Department of Environmental Occupational Health Sciences, and at that time when he was here was not named that, I don't know what his name, to recognize his dedication to worker and public health. So this year's lecturer is Julie Sorensen, PhD, and she's the director of the Northeast Center for Occupational Health and Safety, the Agricultural Forestry and Fishing, Forestry and Fishing, which conducts occupational safety and health research in America's most dangerous industries and seeks to create affordable, culturally relevant, and easily implementable solutions for farmers, loggers, and fishermen. Dr. Sorensen has led the development of a National Rollover Protection Structures Program, NRRP, which links farmers to ROPS suppliers and provides cost sharing for the installation of these important safety devices. She has also developed interventions for commercial fishermen, including life, jacket, life jackets for lobstermen program, which is highlighted by Forbes magazine as a fitting strategy for saving li lobstermen's lives. Dr. Sorensen was recently awarded the Researcher of the Year by the Agricultural Safety and Health Council of America and has received the NORA, which is NIOSH program partnering Award for Worker Health and Safety. She earned her PhD in Epidemiology from Umea University in Umea, Sweden, has been working in the realm of occupational health and safety research for over 20 years. Um, I'd like to bring up Julie and present her with a, a nice crystal award here for the uh, oh, uh, Bryce Lecture. Sure. Um, in the box, and I will turn it over to Julie. Okay. And actually, I should note. I should note that her topic is nudging workers for employers towards safer behavior. And when I first heard the topic, I was thinking, is it nudging or nudging? If you know the difference, nudging is a Yiddish term for pestering or bothering someone. But I read a little bit of the book that one of the authors wrote, and they they really call out the difference between nudging and nudging. Where nudge, nudging is basically. Um, it's basically, well, nudging is to poke gently in the ribs, especially the elbow, nudging. <laughs> but nudging is to alert, remind, or mildly warn someone. So it's there is a difference between nudging and nudging. And you're going to talk about nudging. I will. That's good decision. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, can everyone hear me okay? All good? Okay. So uh, I just wanted to, to thank uh, the facilitators of the Brise Award uh, and endowed lectureship for the invitation to join all of you today. I think um, I read a little background about your father and uh, I was very impressed with his dedication and advocacy for workers and really uh, everyone's right to live in a health and safety, uh, healthy and safe environment. And uh, I really have to admire the perseverance and outspoken uh, you know, th these qualities that he brought to his uh, life's passion. Um, because I think, you know, these are the essential qualities for successful change agents. And uh, so nice that your father embodied those values and were, was able to utilize that in ways that really moved the need needle and made a difference in people's lives. And so <clears throat> what I'm hoping is to, uh, in following his passion and his his ability maybe in, to inspire uh, everyone here today to think about uh, ways that we can move the needle and make a difference in people's lives, maybe by thinking a little differently about the prospect of human behavior change. So um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's see. Is that good? Let's see. Is it the... <laughs> Is 
the, uh, just, okay. I'm sure I can figure it out. <laughs> All right. So just to give you a little background uh, on my presentation today, I'd like to share some information about the Northeast Center, uh, which is where I serve as the director. Um, we're located in Cooperstown, New York, and I don't know if anyone is familiar with Cooperstown, but if you're a baseball fan, yes, I'm sure you know where we are. Um, and so our center covers from Maine to West Virginia. So we conduct occupational safety and health research in various states in the Northeast region. We're a little different uh, in that we're part of a hospital system with an expansive research mission. And we have a staff of about 37 researchers, safety specialists, occupational clinicians, biostatisticians, social workers, and administrators. And um, what we really are focused on is conducting surveillance, um, etiological research. We develop interventions and also provide training to workers on health and safety. And we also provide occupational health care. Um, and like our sister center, PNASH, we work with all three industries, agriculture, forestry, and fishing. And I'll talk a little bit uh, more about those industries in the upcoming slides. But um, so that's just a little bit uh, about me and, and our uh, background, uh, background of our center. Um, so over the past two decades, my research has really focused primarily on developing health and safety interventions that are focused on behavior change. And um, the industry groups that I've partnered with hail from the industries I just mentioned, ag, forestry, and fishing. And as you can see uh, in the figure on this slide, they are some of the most dangerous industries in the United States. Um, it, you can see from this slide, it has the uh, collective fatality rate for ag, forestry, and fishing op operations, which is about roughly seven to eight times that of the average uh, industrial fatality rate. And that trend has uh, remained somewhat uh, steady over the last uh, well, at least from two, uh, 2008 to 2018. Um, and I think one of the questions that I'll be referring back to is kind of wondering why after um, the implementation or uh, investment of consider considerable resources dedicated to reducing injuries and fatalities uh, on the job over the past few decades, why do we still have really unacceptably high rates of injury and fatality in these industries. So um, I think that, you know, one of the central questions that much of the, many of the researchers working in this realm are trying to unravel is why, um, what, are, what are the factors that contribute to the relatively high injury and fatality rates in these industries? and um, the reality is there are likely many factors. Um, we have, uh, you know, exposure to hazardous equipment, unpredictable weather, animals, uh, large animals that uh, are kind of uh, hard to predict what they're going to do. There are long work hours. The work is, you know, physically demanding. And uh, very often, a lot of the workers that we work with may have had a prior injury and those prior injuries can limit range of motion, agility, um, reaction times. So there are many factors that, that make these jobs somewhat dangerous. But um, in addition to these environmental factors, uh, there are consistent drivers of work-related injury, fatality, and illness um, that really kind of relate to behavior change. And so that's one of the things I'll be focused on uh, for much of today's discussion. So, you know, I guess in asking the question, why are workers still dying? Again, a complicated question. And doubtless, it isn't one thing that has impeded our progress in making improvements in these uh, industries when it comes to occupational safety and health. But um, I think one of the the key issues is successfully changing human behavior. So just to give you an example, in the occupational safety and health field, we often for, refer to the three E's, right? So education, enforcement, and engineering. So those are the traditional mechanisms we've had 
to improving uh, or reducing injury and fatality rates. But um, as we all know, these can be more or less effective. So if you think about behavior change, when we provide tra training to workers, well, hopefully they apply what they've learned in those trainings to changing how they're doing work. But you have to deal with things like worker disinterest, information retention, maybe lack of agency, maybe what the workers learn they can't put into practice, or very often ignoring risk can provide immediate benefits. Enforcement also challenges there. They can be unpopular with the industries um, that are targeted in regulation, can be difficult to enforce. Industry management might have competing priorities and even engineering, which can be very, very, a very successful way of improving uh, the health and safety track record. Even that can be um, somewhat uh, difficult or it's not perfect. Um, I've seen examples where safety systems have been disabled. Um, we've, I've seen examples of safety systems breaking and not being repaired. Um, and often solutions can be expensive and sometimes these industries are working on a shoestring budget. So um, just a few factors that make it difficult to implement some of these strategies. So getting back to human behavior, you know, obviously human behavior is complicated. Um, I wanted to share this quote from Dr. Daniel Gilbert. He's a social psychologist and Edgar Pierce professor of psychology at Harvard University. And Dr. Gilbert has written many books, done podcasts, hosted a television series on uh, the connection between complexities of time and social life. But as he points out in this quote, the human brain is the only object in the known universe that can predict its own future and tell its own fortune. The fact that we can make disastrous decisions, even as we foresee their consequences, is the great unsolved mystery of human behavior, right? So why do we do this as human beings? Well, one of the things that I'll be talking about as I talk about nudging is maybe beha human behavior isn't such a mystery, right? Um, so in this presentation, I'll explore the possibility that human behavior may be more predictable or intelligible than we think. To begin with, Gilbert's quote is really predicated on the assumption that all human decisions are considered, right? How true is this? So getting back to our three E's, if we look at the prevention strategies that are typically employed in worker safety and health, many of these also presuppose that workers are making carefully considered decisions. So with worker trainings, we're assuming that workers will apply their, the knowledge they've learned. Enforcement um, also operates under the assumption that workers or businesses know what the rules are or how to implement them. And engineering solutions often require some knowledge of how to be uh, aware of and use the equipment appropriately. So all of these require people to be making thoughtful decisions. So, I think, you know, it can be very valuable just to kind of take a step back and look at our assumptions. So if we look at how human beings process information and make decisions, it may explain some of the mysteries of why, why we haven't made more progress in occupational safety and health. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with dual process theory, but it is a um, psychological explanation for how human beings think reason and make decisions. And this theory splits human cognitive processing into two distinct systems. So we have either, sometimes they're referred to as the implicit or explicit systems. Um, they're often referred to as system one and system two. Those are terms coined by Keith Stanovich and Richard West. But generally uh, what we're looking at is in system one, which is a system where we utilize that we utilize to make decisions uh, and which is very intuitive and instinctive so we're not spending a lot of time thinking about the decision the pros and cons etc the decisions are sometimes unconscious they're very fast they're associative uh, it's kind of decisions we make on automatic pilot and system two is really focused on uh, engaging in rational thinking so we're looking at pros cons takes a lot of energy 
uh, it's slow, it's logical. Um, and what I think is interesting is when you look at dual process theory, you kind of, it makes sense, right? About 95% of the decisions we make are made using system one thinking. Um, and in truth, uh, when we change the context of the decision-making environment, so say we're in an environment where we have less time, less energy, more stressors and more emergencies, the time that we spend in system one thinking is probably going to increase 97%, 98%. In a context where um, we're engaging in new behaviors or new decisions or the stakes are higher or the decisions are more complex, we may spend more time in system two. But generally, this is kind of the way we're processing decisions. So, um, what just happened? Let's see. I think I, I think I might have pressed the wrong button. Sorry. Will those work? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so uh, a few examples of system one thinking, simple things like driving to work, simple math, finishing a popular phrase, turning on your computer. Those are things we can do and we don't even have to think about it, right? We just do it. Um, it takes not much energy and it doesn't take much focus. Um, system two thinking, uh, things like choosing an insurance policy, uh, you know, figuring out complex math problems, learning to play the piano, taking a new route to work. Those are things that all require careful thought, energy, and reflection. So in addition to just talking a little bit about system one and system two, it's kind of interesting to think about the types of errors that occur when you're engaging in system one thinking. So um, people in behavioral economics and nudging like to talk about uh, something called thinking shortcuts. So, um, you know, when we're using system one thinking, we can, um, uh, you know, we often uh, are using these thinking shortcuts, which are also referred to as things like heuristics and biases. So heuristics refer to shortcuts that are, um, you know, shortcuts we take to simplify tasks and decisions while biases are the resulting gaps in judgment that come from these thinking shortcuts. So I uh, give this example of an availability, availability, availability heuristic. So this is a heuristic that really re refers to making a decision based on the information that you have readily at hand versus the information that you could or should be utilizing, but that's not at hand, right? So that's gonna lead to error thinking because you don't have all the information you need. But, uh, you know, I, I give an example, a worker may assume that they don't need hearing protection because nobody else around them is wearing it and they've never worn it, right? They're operating with the information they have, but it's not all the information and it's my, maybe not the right information. Um, another example of a bias uh, is salience, which refers to the bias that favors uh, our, us to focus on the objects or decisions that attract uh, attention because they're noteworthy or they're different. And um, what can happen is this can make uh, it easy for individuals to ignore items or information that's less prominent, but maybe just as important, um, but can lead to error decision-making. Another example of a bias is the priming effect. So you can see this example, um, you know, the, the word in the red box is missing a letter how you fill in that letter is going to be governed by the other words you're presented with, right? So you're likely to put in a U uh, under soup when you've got the kitchen items, you're likely to put in an A for soap when you've got the bathroom items. So uh, very often when we're thinking, our thinking is primed. Um, so um, much of this is uh, discussed in the book Behavior or Nudge uh, which is, was written by uh, Sunstein and Thaler. And I think 
you know, obviously this field has important implications for public health, behavior change research, because, and I think the th when I read this book, the thing I really liked about it is uh, nudging um, strategies don't assume that people are thinking about the decisions they're making. In fact, they're counting on the fact that people aren't thinking about their decisions and they're thinking, okay, how can I rearrange the choice environment to kind of help, you know, I know what kinds of thinking shortcuts people take. Let's set it up so they take the direction I want them to take. Um, so just to give you a few examples, uh, this is an example of a school which, you know, they use the, uh, uh, kind of operating on the salience bias, the recognition of things that are different. And what they wanted to do is direct children to hand sanitation stations. And, you know, children in school, they're busy thinking about other things, they're talking to their friends. If they had put a sign up there that said, please sanitize your hands, probably the kids would ignore it. But by making it stand out, by showing them the actions that they should take, it takes you're increasing the possibility of compliance because you're reducing the effort it takes to be compliant, right? Which can be very helpful in getting people to actually change their behavior. Um, here's another uh, example of a nudge. Uh, this is a picture of a child playing, uh, it's painted on the road and they put it out in front of a school zone trying to get people to slow down. Now, if you're driving down the road and you see this, your brain is automatically going to hit the brake, right? Because you think you see a child. So, and you know, the next time you drive down that road, it serves as a reminder, oh, I have to slow down. There are children here. I don't want to run over anyone. So it's a way of just kind of not requiring the person to think, but allowing them to make the right decision. What don't wanna. Um, so, and, I think what's interesting, and one thing I'll I'll talk a little bit about more, is there there are different types of nudges. So some nudges are focused on being encouraging. Some are focused on discouraging a behavior. Sometimes people know they're being nudged, and sometimes they don't know they're being nudged. Um, so there are uh, various ways of nudging people, um, and I think this is an important thing to note because. If you read the literature on nudging, there are concerns, right? So if you are encouraging people to subconsciously engage in a behavior, the assumption there is that um, you know what's best for them, right? So in a way, well, actually what you are is covertly violating the individual's autonomy by directing them in a certain, you know, to a certain behavior. Um, and, you know, there's a danger in that. Can we really know what's in the individual's best interest? They have many competing priorities. How can we know what uh, what's most important to them? But, um, and the other problem with, uh, with nudging is, um, you know, it, uh, it can erode the public's trust, which is certainly not something that you want. So while it may be more effective, there are also some ethical uh, concerns there. Um, so, but we do need viable solutions for behavior change and, uh, you know, it's quite possible this is an effective strategy. So how do we get around these ethical concerns? So while there are many types of nudges, there's also a spectrum, right, of, you know, nudges that are very transparent to those that are less transparent. Um, there are nudges that uh, allow for autonomy and some that uh, are less conducive to providing that autonomy and making a decision. So if you look at uh, the different types of nudges, type two nudges are a way of encouraging the right behavior, making it less effortful to engage in the right behavior by employing cues to action or other strategies. Um, but it also gives the ad individual autonomy and they know they're engaging in it, right? So they have the choice to engage it or not. Um, Cass Sunstein, one of the co-authors of the book Nudge, wrote about, um, he uh, had a publication called People Prefer Type 2 Nudges. He'd done a national survey to see, you know, if people have a preference. And interestingly, when it comes to, especially things like law and policy, 
majority of people did prefer uh, system two nudges or type two nudges. So uh, obviously the public wants a say in what they're doing. Um, so this brings me to what I'd like to share with you today. So I've, I've done a lot of interventions and behavior change. Um, I worked in social marketing, you know, kind of employed a number of strategies. And I think the thing that, that, I, that I think nudging provides for us is a way to address this issue with people not thinking about what they're doing. So I wanted to explore the possibility, could you work with target populations to create nudges? So this is not something that's generally done in nudging interventions, right? Because I guess the philosophy is that if people know they're being directed, they won't engage in the nudge. But I really wanted to test that out. So I've been working with a research team that piloted an, a novel approach to nudging, which really involves uh, co-creating the nudges with the nudging targets. And, um, you know, the benefit of this is that it still provides a behavior change strategy that reduces the effort for the individual who needs to change their behavior, but also by getting their input, it's possible you could make the nudge even more effective, right? Because it's in their best interest, they want it to work, and they know a little bit about what drives their own behavior. Um, it's, when I started the project, I did a, a literature review and I could not find any evidence of someone having trialed this. So, um, so it was kind of exciting to think about. So uh, we trialed this approach uh, with a, we decided to do a nudging project on a dairy farm. So why dairy farms? Uh, dairy farms have comparatively high rates of injury and fatality. And uh, the other thing is, if anybody spent time on a dairy, workers are generally tired, they're stressed, they're overworked, so likely engaging mostly in system one thinking. Um, so we reached out to a dairy farmer in central New York, Milk Train, and we asked if she would like to pilot a nudging project. And we asked her, you know, if you were going to do a nudging project, what behavior would you want to focus on? And um, so this is what she said. Hopefully this works. I think that's how we started it was that I was having a communication problem. We had just had some equipment failure and we'd lost some milk and we'd lost milk three or four days in a row. So when I finally said something's going on in group six, then Eli went out and talked to the guys and they told me and I was like, has this been going on for a couple of days? Yeah, it's been going on for six. Nobody told us it was a simple fix. So the, uh, the farm owner, she defined cross-shift communication as discussion between the day shift and the night shift workers. And apparently what was happening is the night shift workers would be tired in the morning, they'd wanna go home. They didn't wanna talk about all the stuff that needed to happen at work. You know, they wanted to socialize, they wanted to go home, they wanted to rest. And so uh, as she said, they, you know, it'd become a problem because they had broken equipment that for, you know, it led to them losing product, but we could see that there would be a safety component to cross shift communication. If there's broken equipment or sick cows, it could affect worker safety. So we said, let's let's focus on that for our intervention. So uh, the research team uh, was myself, uh, uh, colleague Helle Burke Domino, who works for Segus, which is a Danish agricultural consultancy uh, organization in Denmark. John McNamara, who uh, is a agricultural health and safety specialist in Ireland, working for Chagish, which is about, it's like the equivalent of extension. And then Stefan Vandenbroek, who is a psychologist uh, and health literacy expert, who, uh, who is professor at the University of Catholic de Louvain, uh, our NEC staff and the milk train uh, folks. So, um, in order to develop a nudge, it, you really have to spend some time looking at the workspace, doing task assessments, um, looking at the decision-making environment and behavioral influences. Um, so when we were thinking about cross-shift communication, we, we spent some time thinking about where, where are workers congregating? Where are they clocking in? Where are they clocking out? We mapped it out. We asked workers to provide details about their interactions when they were uh, you know, crossing shifts, 
And uh, it was interesting because what the worker said was, you know, again, we're tired, we're distracted, we want to go home, we don't want to talk about work anymore. But when we asked them, what do you talk about when you see your coworkers? And they say, they said, we talk about things we want to talk about, like soccer. They have a soccer league and they, um, uh, you know, talk about the strategies and soccer game. And that's kind of what they enjoy doing. So we took that and uh, what we did was we looked at if we were going to employ a nudging strategy, the factors that we wanted to, to take into account included, you know, what is the impact of fatigue on decision if workers are tired and distracted? Uh, you know, the conversations that they are having are really focused on socializing or distractions from work and uh, also the need to increase convenience and provide socializing opportunities or to promote peer approval given the social nature of the behavior. Um, so I have used something called a basic wheel. And if anybody's interested in nudging, I'd be happy to share that with you. But what it does is it, it takes the, the, the factors that are driving behavior and points you towards the best solutions for those factors. So. You know, in this example, we had workers who had limited willpower because they were tired. Uh, you know, they were experiencing inertia. They just wanted to get home, um, just wanted to, to, you know, kind of ignore the problems that uh, needed to be dealt with. So, you know, good strategies for that are to make it easy, to create social expectations, and to provide feedback. Um, we also noticed that their choices were shaped by context, arrangement, and framing. Um, so social incentives, reversing habit, dealing with competing desires were all factors that we needed to account for. So the intervention needed to make it social, make it attractive and provide cues to action for the workers. So what we came up with was a cross shift communication board that was soccer themed. And we had two teams. We had the day, day shift team and the night team and, uh, you know, again, the, the theme was driven by the worker's self-avowed interest in soccer. And this board was placed uh, where the workers, there's a section on the farm where day shift workers would pass by as they left, night shift workers would pass by as they're coming on uh, onto the farm and vice versa uh, at, in the morning. And uh, it just allowed the workers to interact with the board daily, daily to compete for communication points it makes it very easy. Instead of writing things out, they could just move magnets on the board. They could write short notes with Sharpies. Um, and the concept was vetted with the farm owner and the supervisor and the workers. And so in various iterations uh, and using the recommendations, we improved the board. Uh, took about three or four times to get it right. But eventually uh, we managed to get a layout and format that they were happy with. Um, so, <laughs> and hopefully I can get this to work. Um, but in addition to making the, the task of cross-shift commu communication easier, I think one of the other things we found, and I'll let the farm supervisor explain it, but it seemed to tie into values that they already understood and, and could relate to. See if I can. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's teamwork on the soccer field, teamwork at work. Um, so, there we go. I think uh, the downside to this intervention is we had a lot of evaluation planned. And unfortunately, uh, when we implemented this project, it was around the time of COVID. So we had a lot of, a lot of trouble getting onto the farm to do the follow-up measures because workers weren't vaccinated and the uh, farm owner wasn't comfortable having us come out there. And then right around the time we were getting ready to do the follow-up measures, uh, we had the Farm Worker Fair Labor Standards Act enacted on farms which uh, required overtime pay over 60 hours. And there was a lot of overturn, uh, staff overturn on the farm. So the people we had 
you know, who had been there before uh, weren't the same people uh, when we got back. So unfortunately, we weren't able to really evaluate the intervention, but uh, what we had hoped to do is participate in observation, you know, how are people interacting with the board, uh, interview, interviews with owners and workers, um, and then we had hoped to do a few revisions to the concept if necessary. But I think mostly we want to see, does it work? And unfortunately, we didn't get that opportunity. But um, I think just to wrap up, I, I think the, the primary points I wanted to make is behavior change is challenging but it is such an essential component of every intervention we do. And you know, while we need innovative solutions, we also need solutions that don't assume people are making engaged and careful decisions because rarely is that the case. But the nice thing about nudging is if people aren't thinking about the decisions that they're making, it's possible to plan for that, right? Because they're predictably irrational to coin the term in the book that was written on this topic. Um, and, uh, I think the, the interesting thing, and I think the thing that we've brought to the, to the concept recently is, you know, it might be very effective to engage targets in designing these nudges and choice environments. And it certainly addresses the ethical concerns that have been leveled to the field. But, um, and then, you know, hopefully if we can do this again, we can actually see if it's even more effective than not involving the workers. Um, so I think that that pretty much wraps up uh, my discussion of nudging. Uh, there are a few videos uh, that are featured here. Um, if you would like to check out how this has been employed on various operations. The Segus uh, pig farm video, they use nudging interventions to uh, set up a chemical use station. I think it was genius. Um, they also did something similar on a dairy farm. Um, and then there are some other resources there for you. But um, I think that's pretty much it. If you want, uh, that QR code will take you to a video on the Dairy Safety Project. And um, I think if you leave with one, remembering one thing, <laughs> it's that people are probably paying less, less attention than you think, which, you know, is, is, you know, I think that's just reality, but you can plan for that. So that's the, uh, the positive news I'll share. So I guess that's it. Thank, thank you so much for a fantastic lecture. Uh, we have about 30 people online on the Zoom, so I want to welcome them um, and invite them to add questions to the Q&A. And then we also have about 30 people in the room. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand for Dr. Sorensen, and I'll bring the microphone to you. Um, so you can just And you could share your name as well. Hi, uh, Julie. Welcome. I'm Mike Yost. Um, my question is, how does uh, this approach compare, nudging approach compare to things like traditional economic incentives? You know, give them a gift card or something like that. Has that ever been done? Yeah. So um, that's a hard question. To, oh, sorry. Um, so you could use an economic approach in a nudging approach. It's not like they have to be separate, right? Um, the, I think whenever I am developing an intervention, what I'm often trying to do is understand what is the basic problem here? If, if the problem with behavior change is that the reason the person isn't doing it is because they don't have the financial wherewithal to do it, then an economic approach makes perfect sense. If the reason the person isn't doing it is because they're tired, they're stressed, they're not thinking, they're doing what everybody else is doing, then a financial incentive isn't going to be helpful. But in that case, probably nudging would be more effective. Then you have social marketing, right? And social marketing is more about not trying to make the decision less effortful, but trying to move the barriers, trying to remove the barriers the person might experience uh, in trying to enact safer, healthier behaviors. So a good example of that might be if you were a mom 
and you wanted to immunize your kids, but you have no way to get them to the doctor's office to get an immunization. A nudge isn't gonna work very effectively there, but a social marketing initiative where you provide free transport and maybe childcare for the other children will get people, you know, those types of people to that immunization clinic. So it, I think there are a lot of strategies and not every strategy is perfect for every situation. It's just a matter of lining it up correctly. Hi, my name is Mallory Thomas. Um, I was wondering when you have a nudge, um, is there a measurement of how, when it becomes habitual for a certain percent of your workforce, um, is there like a certain percent that you're trying to meet when you say this is successful, there has been behavior change um, or what is the measurement? How do you measure success, I guess? How do you measure success? That's a very good question. And I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but I think, um, well, I think measuring success for nudges, I think the probably the, the best way to do that is participant observation. So, you know, I don't know what is success. If 50% of the people are engaging in the behavior, I think that's certainly better than nothing. 25%, again, better than nothing, but you certainly hope for, for better. Um, I don't know that there's any specific cutoff, but, but what I do think is helpful is if you're examining the nudge and its success from a participant observation perspective, you are able to get a better sense of what is going wrong. So that, and that's why I said with this intervention, we had hoped to get back out on the farm to see, you know, how are workers using this? How's it, how's it being executed? Because probably a few more rounds would have been very helpful. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question, but it's a difficult one. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we do have a question in the in the chat, and then I'll come to you. So it's from John Garland, and um, he's asking about the workforce. I think in ag, which is um, primarily Hispanic, and so did you consider sort of the culture of those workers in your work and how you would adapt the nudging um, to that worker well, population? I think it's a good question. Um, I think the way we tried to adapt. Uh, the intervention to those workers to, is to have them involved in the process, right? So, and I think that's what I loved about co-creating a nudge. Typically, nudges are created without the person's input, but, um, you know, the workers told us, you know, what it was like to try to fit cross-shift communication into an already busy day. They talked about the, the barriers they had to doing that. They talked about what it was like, it, you know, how much energy they had, and what they like to talk about. And so I think, you know, that's how we try to do that is to have them involved in the entire process. I think we have a question here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Maggie Leland. So two questions. One is, um, I would think that by having the workers involved, just that exercise of having them think about the problem, think about the solution, think about the whys, would create behavior change in itself or make the nudge more successful. Is that something that you've experienced? You know, I think it's true. It's uh, the Hawthorne effect by just <laughs> engaging, you're changing things, right? So I think that's very true. The, the other nice thing about involving workers in the process is you've then given them the tools to do it themselves next time, right? So if they know, oh, I really should be doing this, but you know, I don't really have the energy, I don't have the motivation, I have other things competing for my attention, they can plan accordingly or rearrange their choice environments. So. And I would also think that some of the nudges need to be revisited because it seems like it would become something you could easily tune out as over time again because it's not something novel it's not something working that it can become easy to turn out tune out so how do you, how do you go about um refreshing those or revisiting the need for new nudges yeah well and i think again you know it kind of depends on the context ideally you know what you're what you're fighting in behavior change is habit right uh there's inertia 
if you can get workers to be using it regularly for a few weeks, for a few months, it becomes habit. And hopefully they just keep doing that because it's now the new normal, right? It's now what they do. That's not always going to happen. And I think, uh, you know, that's why ongoing evaluation, six months, a year, year and a half, see long-term, you know, what are the effects of these nudges? I think that would be very helpful information. Other questions in the room? Hi, my name is Katie. I'm wondering, in addition to the nudge, what was the um, management approach as far as you know consequences for noncompliance, and was there any changes on behalf of how the management interacted with the workers once this intervention was put in place, you know, to allow the the nudge to do its job as opposed to sort of um, draconian management techniques, for example. Right. Yeah. Well, so management buy-in was, it was crucial. Right. And so what Colleen was saying is initially, you know, when workers weren't engaging in cross-shift communication, she would just get upset, you know, and then they know the boss is mad and, but wasn't really changing anything. Um, by using this approach, she had to be invested, right? Because the workers were competing for points and the winning team would get incentives like a pizza party or gift certificates or things like that. So she had to be willing to invest in that and she had to be willing to re reinforce and you know, ensure that you know, the points as they were being tallied were valid. So she had to be a little bit more involved, but I think in the end, you know, she's getting the behavior that she wants. And, and instead of using a negative approach, okay, I'm going to be angry if you don't do this, it's more of a incentive positive approach. But, uh, you know, again, we weren't able to go back and evaluate. Uh, um, I mean, maybe you don't have the information, but did she change her, say, employee discipline policy in any way because of this intervention? No, I think she was hoping to avoid having to do that. I think... You know, sometimes the carrot is better than the stick. And I think she, the other thing too is dairy farms are so desperate for workers. They are really reticent to be, um, to, to come down harshly or to focus more on discipline. So this was a way of ensuring that the workers were happy, but she was getting what she needed. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting in um, previous career before becoming a student here, I managed nurses and CNAs in a post-acute care setting, and they have some very similar challenges. Mm -hmm. um, night shift wants to go home, day shift shows up, there's a bunch of call lights, nobody wants to read the chart, nobody wants to you know, pass on information. It's also a, an industry that's very um, difficult to staff, and so workers are at a premium, and you don't want to be too... Um, yeah. You don't want to lose workers that you don't have to lose. Exactly the same. I think it might be a little more challenging there because like what, what you couldn't see on the board is they didn't really have to write a whole lot. All they had to do was move things around on the board to communicate. I'm not sure you could do that in that setting, but there probably are things that you could do just by, I mean, it, it's hard for people to change their habits and you have to find a way to, to reduce the effort if you want people to buy in. And with a little thinking and planning, it's often easier to do that. It'd be an interesting problem in that setting to try to figure out if you could use nudging. Thanks, Julie. Yeah. Uh, well, I wasn't gonna, not, we could clap next. I have a question. Okay. Okay, okay, well, <laughs> so why don't we thank Julie and she'll be, we'll have a reception upstairs uh, shortly after. And we can ask questions there as well and meet the family as well. So thank you. For coming yeah, thank you. Thank you for your help, Elena.
And thanks online yeah. for the questions. We'll be sharing them. Um, there were a couple that came in at oh. the very end. So we'll share them with Dr. Um, Shall I just speak into the mic? Well, I think we have to leave the room because oh, there's okay. another class coming in. Yeah, if you want, do you want to email them? Yeah, I'm happy to Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, too, and I update people's contacts. Okay. Yeah. yeah.